Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? It's the monthly beer with Brian. And here we are, September 15th, 2021. And it's funny. I'm recording this before five o'clock on a weekday. And the, you know, the, the segment's called Beer with Brian. But I think what we're really looking at, should we name it, rename it Water with Brian? Because <laughs> it's before five. Anyway, these are the monthly ruminations and ramblings of comic book creator and all around pop cultural carnivore Brian Polito. So let's get right to it, shall we? I think first up, as we sit, about 10 days from now, we have a thing called Crucial Con going on. I'm not gonna talk about anything about Crucial Con, but what's fun about it is we're gonna make a lot of announcements about our publishing schedule, about some licensed items, and hopefully you'll be excited by what we are going to present. Part of what we do at Crucial Con is, or by the time we get to Crucial Con, behind the scenes, we have built out the entire year of 2022 in terms of publishing, licensing, at least the broad skeleton. And in many cases, we're actually very far ahead in the writing. So we've written Lady Death Chapter 15 to be named a Crucial Con. We've written, or it's in process, La Muerta Chapter 8 named to be revealed at Crucial Con. Lady Death Chapter 16 is plotted and et cetera, et cetera. And I would say most recently we locked what Hell Witch Chapter 5 named to be revealed is about. And additionally, I completed a script in its entirety for something that we're going to announce at Crucial Con. So lots coming up on Crucial Con. Now I am a very, very lucky person. I have people who are my friends uh, who, who send me cool stuff. Like I don't know how it began with, with many fiends. We became friends. Where does it begin? Where does it end? I don't know, but I consider some of the things I'm going to show you are from guys I consider friends. So. First up, I'm going to just share cool stuff. And like a lot of you out there, I'm, I'm an obsessive creator. You don't see me talking about it too much. I kind of keep it on the low. But if I'm actually not making comic books, I'm probably collecting comics or pop cultural items. Like that's it. Or then organizing them into some sort of order. So that's 90% that's of my waking moments that are not like family time. So first up, here is a phone card. Now this phone card was gifted to me by Fiend Ambassador Troy Hudson. And phone cards were these things that came out in the mid to late 90s and for like a hot minute they were the hottest collectible on earth. So I don't remember exactly how many were made, maybe 8, maybe 10, I'm not sure, maybe someone can help. But there was uh, phone cards made of Lady Death. Chastity and this cool evil Ernie one, which I do not have. Now, I'd also be remiss if I didn't tell you that very recently, another uh, fiend who became a friend, Tony Buck, sent me several phone cards. And I believe between this one and the ones Tony sent, it may complete the collection. And then these guys are immediately going to go into the archive for display. So if you make it out to Swornfest, you'll get to see these kooky things called phone cards. Now, by now, most of you know I am a big Captain America fan. And if you don't, now you do. I, uh, I do collect a lot of Captain America comics and or magazines, and I'm sort of a purist. I have one Captain America statue. I'm perfectly happy with it. I have an old Captain America Sentinel Liberty badge from the 40s, and I'm looking for a membership card. I am looking for a membership card in good shape. But generally, I'm a purist, so I kind of like everything that's related to paper. So my pal, again, Troy Hudson, really kind enough to send me this really neat thing. So first up is a very lovely shape, too. Stanley presents Marvel's Mysterious Secret Messages. I don't know much about secret messages. I probably don't even have the patience to put something like that together. But my attraction to this item is there's, there's my guy, Captain America. And... I'm looking at this and I'm really trying to figure out who is the artist. Is this a Jack Kirby body? Did John Romita, who worked in the bullpen, redo the face? I don't know. It's lost the time. For fun, let me open it and see if there's more cap art on the back. I don't know. Let's see. 
Well, yeah, there's some characters. There's Cap in one of his classic standing positions, Nova, Storm, and Scarlet Witch. And inside, let's see here. Yeah, cool black and white puzzles with, oh, wow, neat Marvel art. Wow, cool. Okay, this is tangential, but I just noticed there is, wait, there was some X-Men art. Okay, X-Men art, and I'm pretty sure that was Dave Cockrum. Why that's interesting is I have unearthed a Dave Cockrum Lady Death piece. It was a commission, gorgeous piece. So I'm actually gonna reach out to his estate and see if I can get permission to turn into a comic book cover for next year. Oh yeah, that's, I'm pretty sure that's Dave Cockrum too. Yeah, great, so cool, neato, fun, 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 fun. So that's the secret messages. Probably have to figure a couple of them out, out at least. One of the odd things that Marvel Comics does is like we all know the comics you could get in the shops, but Marvel throughout time has licensed their characters out to the strangest companies and they would create a story that kind of plays to that company. So here's one, again, gift from Troy Hudson. Amazing. Actually, was on, I, I really wanted this for a little while, so this was quite clever. So here is Captain America and the Campbell Kids. So the Campbell Kids, you'll notice them, these are from the Campbell soup cans. So this is uh, fun, odd stuff. And again, like this is, there's a little division of Marvel that would actually hire their characters out and they would put together a comic book for a client like Campbell Soup here. And I haven't even read this, but I am guessing in the foreground that, I'm just guessing that the villain is going to be something related to soup or something. So let's see, let's see here. It says, the battle of the energy drainers. So for fun, let's just flip through a couple of these pages. America needs energy. So I think what they're selling kids is that soup means energy. But yeah, there's Cap, flanked by the Campbell Soup Kids. Beautiful art, but you know, it's gonna be a, just a peculiar story. I have to look at it again, who knows? Yeah. Very odd. Ah, the energy drainer. So this really is a custom made comic, not, for, not uh, in Marvel continuity, what I like about this comic is you'll notice that no one has uh, done this puzzle. That's kind of helpful, right? And it keeps the quality high. But there's poor Cap fighting some crazy energy drainer and it's gonna have something to do with the Campbell Soup Kids, all these peculiar adventures. But look at the effort, that's amazing. The Campbell Soup Kids look at energy in America's history. Okay, that's crazy. So, in all likelihood, the makers of Campbell's Soup paid Marvel a decent price, and then somehow these were distributed. And I don't know enough about the history of how they were distributed. But yeah, it even has like chapter four even. And these little Campbell's Soup kids keep calling back. <laughs> They're totally guest stars in this strange comic. And I haven't seen it, but I'm gonna just guess based on feel, this is published 74, 75, 76? I don't know, we'll see. I'm gonna check the indicia. Yeah, so I don't know what to make of it. It's goofy, I like it. There's Cap, he's really happy. The kids, let's see here, Keep It Up America, you're doing a superhero job. And a special award from Captain America and the US Department of Energy. Okay, somehow Campbell gets together with Department of Energy and they make this. So, a couple things. It's got the smell. Now, let's see, we'll check the indicia and see when this thing was made. So Bill Mantlo was the writer. Bill Mantlo sadly passed away, but how you guys would know him is he was the creator of Rocket Raccoon. Uh, so let's see here, so, okay. Oh, 1980, okay, so that late. And the art is by Al Cooperberg and Herb Trimpey and Dan Green. I remember Dan Green from his run in Defenders, Herb Trimpey, of course, Hulk, and a lot of other great stuff. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Well, we might probably spent too much time, and this I just really revealed myself to be that particularly nerdy. But um, so a 1980 book, 41 years old, Campbell Soup Kids, really weird. And I do collect those, so any cap premiums are neat. Now, I have another pal. He and I go back to the mid early 90s. Uh, Jeff Henson, and I'm sure he's a club member. And Jeff sent something that is really wild, and I'm going to show it to you today. 
So feast your eyes on this. This is the evil, the unproduced evil Ernie mask. Now, to me, it's unproduced for some obvious reasons because it's not, not of the greatest quality. But I'll tell you a little bit about the history of it. So there's a company named Michael Burnett Productions who exists to this day, and they actually are a service provider for, uh, I think, Universal Studios Florida. And you know they make effect stuff. And I met new Michael Burnett. And Michael Burnett made the first ever smiley pin. He also made the much reviled Evil Ernie model kit. Remember those garage model kits back in the day? This thing was so difficult to put together. It was you know, very primitive. Um, but uh, Michael expressed some interest to do an Evil Ernie mask. And uh, in our archive, we actually have a revised version of the mask. But yeah, so this, very few were produced, I think. I'm not even, I don't know the provenance of how Jeff got a hold of this, but Jeff is definitely a hardcore Evil Ernie fan and uh, has some, a beautiful art collection of Evil Ernie. But I mean, what I'd say they got successful is maybe the, the smile and the teeth. One of the tricks that we had I'd agreed upon with Hughes was that this smile actually connected to the back of his ear. So it, it, Evil Ernie's smile didn't come out this way. It actually came up here. So kind of we had to figure out the logistics of it, this crazy impossible smile, and it kind of caused that strange. So that's where they kind of got, got it a little differently. And then also, I mean, some of the things that are kind of an is at issue with this is how compressed his face is, the distance between his eyes and his lower cheek is too too close, and even that he has any kind of eyeballs, you know, maybe it'd be better if they were just kind of cut out, because uh, the eye slits for the person to see is above it. And then I think the toughest thing about this Ernie mask is the hair, because of course, in reality, evil Ernie's hair would be like this big. Now, so thank you, Jeff, we're gonna put this definitely in the archive on display. Um, what people might know from the long history is that we did continue to work with Michael Burnett studios and we made another evil Ernie. It was this life-size evil Ernie that was on the back of the evil Ernie storyline called Straight to Hell. And so we revised the face and we got the, the costume. But I, and the intention was to have it be a man in a suit and kind of walk around cons and just blow people's minds. And, but I made a really critical error. And my critical error was we had our graphic designer, Mike Flippin, wear it. And Mike is six foot nine, so completely unique in terms of size. And we couldn't really have Mike going around at cons wearing the suit, spending all his time doing that when he really had to be working on all the graphic design. So that suit was maybe used just a handful of times for some nice photo shoots. And then, and then we had to retire it because there was, we could never find a replacement six foot nine person. So yeah, it was kind of a funny mistake. Tangential to this, topic i remember you know this is the heyday when you know it's the 90s the print runs are crazy we have buckets of cash and it's like what do we do with this cash it's like well let's bring our characters to life and i think i remember hearing a story that rob liefeld built uh, i think his team young blood had some sort of sort of flying chopper or some some crazy flying device plane what have you and he built it but it cost a ton of money it was very difficult to transport. There was nowhere to store it. So I think, you know, they spent a lot of money. It showed up once or twice and they kind of had to retire it. Cause what do you do with that thing? You know, he lives in Southern California. What's, he needs like a, a 20,000 square foot uh, garage to store it. So I only heard that secondhand. So don't hold me to that. So yes, yeah, so that's some things I wanted to show you guys. The crazy evil Ernie mask. I thank folks for uh, sending me stuff. That's nice. These guys know me, so they kind of know the deep trackedness of what I'm after, so I am uh, grateful. Um, you know, another thing to talk about is, let's see, the last couple of weeks of what's been going on with Coffin Comics. Uh, clearly, we just completed the Lady Death Sacrificial Annihilation Kickstarter campaign. And actually, during the day-to-day -day of that campaign, I had finished an outline of a story that I'm going to announce, and then I wrote the first draft, second draft, polished it, and uh, you know, spent three weeks on that, a brand new 48 page story for a character that we're gonna announce at Crucial Con. Then I flipped that over to Mike McLean. He spent about a week on it, doing a little cleanup, editorial, suggestions, and it's done. So more about that story. And even as we sit, so we're just, this is a Wednesday. We completed that Kickstarter on Friday. 
Over the weekend, Nick G uh, made what we call the report. So it tells us how much was uh, purchased of every, every single solitary item. And we're at press on everything. Everything except just a couple of items we wouldn't normally go to press on anyway. So every free bonus item, including the 480K mystery item, gone to press. Um, all the comic books. The things that we don't go to press on just yet because we shouldn't would be the fine art print and the prints. The reason we don't do that is we will continue to offer them during the survey period and it's easier to get an accurate print run and the time to make them is shorter. You know, clearly the time to make these gorgeous offset printed comic books from receipt of files is about six weeks, but a print is, could be like two to five days. So same thing even with these free bonus items, all those trading cards, it's like they went to the printer on Monday. So all that got done. And then that would take us right to Monday and then Tuesday, Wednesday, I just been working on stuff that relates more to the future. I'm already in the planning stages of, uh, let's say several things. So a couple of business orientated things, but then I am working on my plan of HQV2. So I actually plan to upgrade certain areas of HQ for cooler, more enhanced visual representation. I'm gonna update the archive. And it's, it's one thing to say you're gonna do it. It's a whole other thing to plan it. When do you do it? How do you do it? How do you prep the files? So working on that. I'm in the preliminary stage also of the planning for Sworn Fest. The good news is having done a previous fest, we have a lot of the planning and the guides and what worked uh, all laid out. So now it's a matter of what we're gonna do in terms of improvement, process improvement, staffing, that kind of stuff. Um, and to this day, that's how Coffin Comics relies on me. I actually kind of set the plan usually and do a lot of detail and then kind of uh, communicate it out to folks and then different folks have different accountabilities as we kind of head towards um, Sworn Fest. So, you know, as we sit, Swornfest is looking good. I know that, um, you know, things are up and down with the pandemic, but, uh, you know, we're pretty steady as she goes on that one. We may all have to mask up. That might be part of what has to happen in terms of um, local health stuff, but we'll kind of roll with it. We'll do what we got to do. Um, that's what's going on there. I mean, just a lot of fun plans and improvements. We're going to talk about some of those things at CrucialCon as well. So we're going to announce more guests and we're going to announce more new uh, things that we're going to do at the CrucialCon. So that'll be a kind of a good panel to attend during CrucialCon if you haven't yet signed up to become part of Sworn Fest. And I, I think you should. You know, if you're in the domestic United States anywhere, just like get in your car and start heading towards uh, Arizona because it's uh, more fun than a barrel full of monkeys for sure. Um, the other thing that I've been ruminating on is um, a series of, so I'm gonna jump over to pop culture if you're down with that. So there's a series of shows on Netflix that have a tonal sim similarity and I really like them. So I figured I'd talk about them a little bit. So the three series and they're all foreign produced. First one is called Black Summer and it's definitely like a high energy take on zombies. And then the next one is called into the Night, which the second season just debuted last Wednesday and I watched it all. And then the third one is called To the Lake, which I think is Russian produced. Um, Into the Night is French. So let me set all of these up for you. First of all, Black Summer, if you've seen it, great. There's two full seasons. It begins instantaneously from the point of view of uh, a woman and her family and there is a zombie outbreak. And in this six episode series, which I've watched twice over and will watch again, um, in the beginning, you don't see a lot of zombies, but they are relentless. They're high speed. There's a particular episode, I think it's the fourth episode, where it's all about one zombie chasing one man the whole episode. It is excellent. So I highly recommend it. What I like about it is, uh, obviously, the, the stress and the pressure of the supernatural force is horrible, but what's really fun is seeing how people get along or don't get along or behave in these like outrageously apocalyptic situations. And I feel it's really paid off at the end of the first season um, magically. And then the second season was also equally hardcore. So for something that's just you can see on Netflix, I mean, I highly recommend it. So the next one that in the second season was 
was wonderful. It ended on a cliffhanger and uh, it, uh, it resolves nothing, which is fine because that means hopefully we'll get another season. Talk about the other two. Uh, Into the Night. So Into the Night just premiered its second season. They run very short. They're about a half hour to 40 minutes, six uh, episodes each season. And the premise is really simple. I, I don't want to blow it for you, but I don't think it blows it for you because it's, it's uh, knowing it isn't, is, isn't, uh, doesn't stop you in your delight of the story. The premise is the sun is killing everything. The story takes place where a French diplomat jumps on a plane it appears like a hijacking. They get in the plane, and the idea is that the plane itself is always trying to outrun the sun. You know, day into night, refueling in different airports, trying to get around the world, trying to figure out where to settle, where can they go underground. Amazing. So the first season deals with that. Second season just wrapped up, ended on a really good cliffhanger. A lot of tension between people. The, the, the horrific circumstances just bring everything to a boil. So that's that one. See it. Then the third one, delightful, it's called To the Lake. And so outside of major, it follows a small family and their neighbors. And there is a, apparently a kind of unknown pandemic that's killing people off. And so our group of characters is trying to get away from the city and to this lake. And over the course, I think this was also six episodes, over the course of six episodes, high speed, high tension, everything ratcheted up, you know, the survival of people, uh, interpersonal like meltdowns, reveals, secrets, the worst. And one thing I could say about To the Lake that I really enjoyed is that anytime a character got a reprieve or a break, or there's just a moment where they, they get, something happens to them, it's not horrible, you just know literally within 15 seconds, something crappy is going to happen, something terrible is going to happen. And that, that show really delivers. So I think tonally, all three of those series have a, a, a similar feel. I was playing them through my head and saying, wow, what if these things were uh, like all like one universe with these three separate things happening, which would be, I, I don't think anyone could survive that. Anyway, guys, gals, this is me talking like a lunatic, talking about stuff, but Wanted to just catch you up on some stuff. I hope you found this entertaining. This has been the monthly Beer with Brian. And I'll holler at you later.